Well, hello everyone. Thank you for being here. This is Byron King with Investor Intel from Toronto, where we are at the PDAC conference, the Prospectors and Developers Association of Canada, the world's largest uh, mining conference. In uh, it's it's chilly and snowy outside, which is fitting for Canada. Today, we're going to speak with two people: Terry Lynch of Power Nickel, a nickel development uh, junior uh, company that's working in Canada, and Mel Sanderson. Uh, a former executive of Freeport McMoran, also a former Foreign Service Officer of the U.S. State Department, uh, faculty member at the University of Arizona uh, Thunderbird uh, School of Management, and the president of a company called American Rare Earths, a rare earth company, as you might say. Having said all of that, I'm now going to say real quickly, Mel, nice to see you. Terry, nice to see you. Very quickly, just Mel, why don't you tell the viewers, you know, what is American Rare Earths? What do they do? Well, thanks so much, Byron, and good to see you good again, to see you. Terry. Awesome. American Rare Earths is currently working to develop two of the largest rare earth deposits in North America, one of which is located in Arizona and one of which is located in Wyoming. Coincidentally, my two states of residence. Okay. And we're very excited, particularly with the Wyoming Project, which is our new flagship operation. We call it Halleck Creek. And watch this space for some big news towards the end of March and early April. This is a real transition year for ARR, and we're really hitting our stride. Thank you. Uh, Terry, just tell everybody real quick, tell us about Power Nickel. So Power Nickel is in Nickel, as you would expect, in, in Quebec. So we're developing the NISC deposit there. It's a high-grade nickel sulfide mine. Uh, it's about 3.1 million tons of historic resource. We, we're uh, updating our 43101. I expect to report somewhere sort of 8 to 10 million tons sort of to end of June, early July. And that should be enough to make us commercial. So exciting times for Power Nickel. Okay, so uh, everybody who's watching, we have rare earths and we have nickel, both of which are essential to the green economy. They're essential to the current economy, oh, by the way, uh, but this green economy that we're, that we're gonna have, uh, they need that stuff too. So uh, now what I wanted to talk about today in the next few minutes is this ESG stuff, that's environmental sustainability governance stuff. Mel, you are a, a, a well-known expert on this. You've consulted with people, you, you, you worked in uh, Africa for the U.S. government, and uh, you, you're a consultant to Freeport. And t tell the people out there who don't know what ESG is or who may have an idea, but they're not quite, what is this ESG thing that everybody's talking about? What is it? ESG essentially is working to make sure that as we miners develop the resources needed to transform our economy and build a greener way of doing things, that we're also doing it as respectfully for the planet and for the people among whom we live as we possibly can. So that means deploying the best technologies and respectfully including communities, indigenous or otherwise, in our efforts as we build our minds and develop the future. Okay, well, uh, Terry, you work in Quebec. Uh, Quebec has been around for a couple of billion years, but in terms of human habitation, you know, 10,000 since the glaciers went away, uh, you work uh, with uh, Quebecois of the French side and then all the First Nations of, uh, of, of Quebec as well. Is, is ESG a thing uh, yeah, up there? Yeah, ESG is a thing uh, for sure in Quebec. I think it's, it's always been a thing in mining uh, because it was always part of our permitting process. And obviously now we're more focused on it than ever, but Quebec government has done an amazing job of uh, reaching out to the local indigenous groups and local communities and educating them on the benefits of mining. And at the same time, they've done a good job of uh, providing a framework for mining companies to be more proactive and to do a better job of creating environmentally sustainable plans. So I think collectively, they've done an amazing job of uh, creating an environment for progress so we can move, as, as Mel says, to the, the new green economy. Well, I think, it, well, if you look back at history, in the olden days, there were a lot of examples of somebody would find a deposit, they would mine the heck out of it. As soon as the grade went away or as soon as the mine played out, they would walk away and leave a, a mess in the ground, big hole with you know acid drainage and you know ripped up streams and salmon fisheries and all gone and things like that. That doesn't really happen anymore in a proper world, does it, uh, Terry? It, it doesn't Terry? happen in, in our country or in any country any Canadian company operates in because we have to operate with Canadian laws wherever we go. 
So that doesn't happen with Canadian companies. I, you know, there, I think it still happens in some jurisdictions with some companies, but not, not once, thankfully, from here. Now, Mel, you have worked in Africa and in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, if I am uh, correct. Uh, what is, what's going on in, in, in Africa? I mean, it, 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 you hear stories about the Chinese are doing this and that. I mean, there's legacy mining from the colonial days, but what's going on in Africa today? What, 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 what should people know about, uh, about mining in Africa? Well, I mean, I think that people should know that the continent is rich in resources but also rich in complications, unfortunately. Very many of the governments have serious issues with corruption. They do not necessarily, as you were saying, Terry, respect the rights of their own people to be safeguarded and to be treated correctly. Um, so it can, it can be very complicated. Infrastructure is also an issue in several countries. The Congo is a good example. The national infrastructure was destroyed during what was called Africa's World War and essentially has never been rebuilt. And the Chinese, as you mentioned, Byron, are perfectly willing to swoop in, take advantage of the disorganization, do de minimis work, especially in infrastructure, and cart away all the materials that they don't plan to share with anybody else. Well, now, the people out there who are watching this, they may have seen an article or they may have seen videos or whatever of what's called artisanal minings, where you have just people littered by the hundreds or even thousands just working in these horrible conditions in pits like that. Is, is, is that real or is that, is that CGI uh, by some propaganda? So is, is that a real thing these days and where, where does it happen? Unfortunately, it is still a very real thing and it takes place in rural areas across the African continent, but also, you know, in India, also in several Asian countries. It's a byproduct of poverty because the locals know what's in the ground. Their grandfathers and great-grandfathers knew it. And now they have these companies running around that are eager to get what's in the ground. So the purpose of the artisanal miners is to get out there with their picks and shovels and their bare hands if necessary and dig it out themselves in order to be able to capture some of the value of their rocks. Mm -hmm. well, well, Terry, you, you, you're, you're working in the nickel space. Uh, how does how does a modern, well-run mining company move into an area that perhaps has artisanal miners there? And how do you somehow work it out that you know we're, we're going we're to use big machines and we're going to do it in an environmentally correct way, but but you don't have a job anymore? Yeah, you know, I, I mean, we're not doing that obviously with Power Nickel, but I'm, I've been an investor in some companies that that are taking some approaches, and and the approach is you basically work with the local community organization and you make them a part owner in the deal. So, so maybe they might own 10% or something, where the, and that is going theoretically to the artisanal miners. And I've seen this in Brazil and, and other uh, spots in South America. And the idea is to create an environment where they'll actually get, make more money in the long run. And, and, um, and it's, then you can actually do things sustainably. You can actually do the right, uh, take the right approach in terms of developing a mineral resource that's ecologically friendly, that replaces the, the, the thing back to original condition when it's done. Uh, but you have to, and this is where the ESG starts, part comes in, is you have to be proactive and include the local community groups and, and, and get them to be partners, I believe. And, and that's the right approach. Let me just build on that, if I may, because the artisanal miners and the cooperation by professional companies is, is often a flashpoint because um, there, are, there are deep human rights issues that are embedded in, in that structure. As you mentioned, Byron, a lot of what those folks do is literally go out and dig holes. They have no training. They no. do not know how to make a tunnel safe. They do not know how to reinforce. They don't know any of that. And at least in the U.S., I won't speak for every country because I don't know the law of every country, but in the U.S., the law is clear. The professional company assumes the obligation of providing safety training, safety equipment, necessary mining materials, and supervising that process. So for mining companies that are interested, as Terry was just discussing, in that junction, which is very beneficial, potentially, to artisanal miners, also be aware of the risk. Well, now, a lot of people criticize ESG in general. They just say, oh, it's it's inefficient, it's gonna re reduce returns and things like that. But uh, what I'm hearing you say is that in, in so many ways, doing it properly is actually increases the efficiency because artisanal mining is very inefficient. You leave a lot of 
you leave a lot of the, the good material in the ground or it never gets processed or what have you, it washes down the stream. Uh, but but you're, so you're, you're saying that somehow there's a balance or a better balance. When you do ESG right, you're actually doing mining right and in a better way. Is that, is that your, is that? 100%. You that? I mean, ESG can be your bulwark against unjustified accusations because there are organizations, NGOs, and laws, and as long as you are cooperating with some of these NGOs, as long as you are transparent with what you are doing, and as long as you're following the laws, it protects you from corrupt attacks, it protects you from rumor mongering, it, it can help protect you from all kinds of legal suits. But I want to emphasize what you said, doing it right. Because unfortunately, we also have uh, what is being referred to as greenwashing, where companies make a lot of bold statements, but they don't take the actions to support the statements. So you got to be ready to walk the talk if you're going to do ASG right. Yeah, I, I think uh, Mel hit up on a very key point there. In this world, you can't really hide if you're a public company. They're going to if you're if you're not actually walking the walk, they're going to call you out. So you better you know know what your core principles are and stick to them. And, and, and apply them along the way. The, um, I think the, the neat part about being a Canadian company, and I think the Americans have the same sort of rule set, is that we have to take our principles that are active here and export them to anywhere we go around the world. Right? And obviously it's put us uh, sometimes at a competitive disadvantage to others that don't have the similar rules, but in the long run, we're in the right spot. And maybe the market's coming back to that now. And I think we're gonna start to see you know, there's going to be some value propositions where people will be going, say, you know, Canadian nickel versus not throwing rocks at them, but, you know, dirty Indonesian nickel. You know what I mean? And, and, and I mean, obviously, you know, the world needs so much nickel that we need to figure out a better way for Indonesian to harvest that nickel in an environmentally friendly way. But I think those things are, be, are going to be coming. And that's why I think you're going to start to see some localized pricing, you know, where you're going to get a price point for North American nickel and a price point for, for other nickels and other commodities as well. Same thing for rare earths. I, I know I've, I've just recently read, read some research on rare earth, uh, you know, I think they were talking about Mountain Pass versus mm -hmm. the, one of the big Chinese uh, yeah. sites and how, you know, it's like a third less uh, carbon impact. Well, that's got to be factored in some way, some way, somehow, to make it more economic for us to get investment for rare earths in America and nickels in Canada, et cetera. 100%. The market needs to reward good ESG. Exactly. Yeah. And actually, there's a political reward for good ESG as well, because you take Africa, specifically take the Congo as an example. There's, there's a large Chinese presence there, has been for years. But America and Canada remain the preferred partners in the mining industry, and it's because we treat people right. Right. Yep. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay, well, thank you both, everybody out there who's watching. Thank you for watching. Again, uh, Mel Sanderson from American Wear Earth, Terry Lynch from uh, Power Nickel. Uh, we, we were talking about ESG, and we hope that this has been informative. Uh, again, thank you for watching. Uh, thank you both. Good luck to both of you for what you're doing. Great. Thanks so much. Thanks. Cheers.